Okay, I hope everyone can hear me now. Um, I think the recording should have been started, so I think we can begin. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Qubit Community Meeting. It's um, October 23rd uh, in 2024. Um, my name is Daniel Hiller. I'm taking over for Andrew, who is trying to fix his mic problems. Um, and he'll reboot and uh, then probably take over. I hope everyone can see my screen OK. Yep, you can see it. Great. Thanks for confirming. Um, so first of all, um, let me introduce you to what is going on here. Um, we have the uh, weekly community meeting um, every Wednesday at uh, 4 p.m. C 3 p.m. CST. Um, so or 4 p.m. I don't know. <laughs> you could, could check out the community calendar. Um, I'm going to drop the link to the Google document that is holding the um, meeting notes uh, into the chat so that everyone can take, um, can take this. Uh, you have to be signed up to the Kubernetes mailing list to access that one. Just a quick reminder. Please um, add your attendance to the, uh, to the document. Um, I'm just going to do that also and to do that up front so that no one else is getting confused. Um, so first of all, if uh, your organization is using Qbert, um, either uh, like as a vendor or otherwise, please um, add your organization to the adopters markdown. You can follow us on Twitter. We have a Twitter account, which you can also find in the community meeting notes. Um, there is a community page where you can find everything about Qbird as a starting point. And if you are a regular contributor, we uh, recommend that you join the Qbird org as a GitHub project member. So my next question would be, do we have any new members this week that would like to introduce themselves to the community? OK, I think that is a no. Um, then um, let's take a quick look at the schedule. Um, there should have been the milestone yesterday where feature freeze had happened. I think this has not yet been the case, since also normally we are using the branch, uh, the branching um, for the next release branch on that uh, feature freeze day. I figure there is something holding up. I'm not completely sure about the circumstances. Maybe anyone from the community can um, um, can can give their two cents about this. Why this is ah yeah thanks Lubo. Um, so I was just uh, seeing in the chat that Lubo um, told everyone that the branch is cut, which is great. So next milestone will be then the first RC zero release and. Um, the, on the 29th of October this year. Um, and uh, then from then on, we will go on with RC1 and GA um, in November. Um, call for papers check-in. Let's take a quick look. I don't, I'm not sure if there is something that is coming up, but let's see. Hey, Andrew, is that your microphone that I hear or was that Stu? No, yeah, that was me just um, tapping to see if it works. It does work, right? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. So awesome, that's great. awesome. <laughs> um, so, okay, do you want to take over? I just got to the community wiki events uh, overview. I think the, the next um, conference that we have up, listed up here is the KubeCon EU 25. Uh, yep. Um, yeah, and that is due at the end of September, November. Um, it'll be in London, England next year, uh, first week of April. Um, so there is still a month of, um, of time before that submission is due, um, but this is a famously difficult conference to get into. So 
if you are thinking of going, if you do want to uh, submit to something, it's best to get work on it now and um, reach out if you'd like any help refining your um, uh, submission to make it more competitive. Um, and maybe it makes sense to work with someone else as well. And so, um, yeah, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, yeah, whenever. Uh, the other thing that's not on there yet, I just wrote an email today about it, is that the, um, what's called the Verdant Cloud Infrastructure Dev Room at FOSDEM was accepted. Uh, I don't know when they're going to put out their CFP, but it will be relatively soon because I think it's only open for, it, they all need to be due in two weeks or something. So also something to keep in mind. Uh, I'll, I'll add that to the um, document this afternoon. Thank you. One thing to chime in here real quick while there's radio silence. There's only a tiny amount of people that actually put their name on the document. Uh, there's quite a few people in the room. I invite you to uh, mark your attendance if you wish. Yes, you're a good reminder. I think um, that always makes sense to to add your name to that so that we have like a, uh, an overview of the schedule. Um, okay, so uh, switching over to the agenda notes, uh, the first point is by me. Um, Brian and me were recently discussing um, how we would continue with looking at the reviewers and approvers on the release branches. Uh, Jed opened up this quite a while ago. Um, and saying that uh, uh, on the old release branches, there is like um, old approvers who have been turned to emeritus in the main branch. Um, and we should at some point somehow sync um, the reviewers and approvers from the main branch towards the release branches. Um, which brings us to the question, uh, whether it would be a good idea that we, um, as a first step, probably just would filter out any non-existing release reviewers or approvers uh, from the older branches, um, since I think it's quite hard to sync owners' files, um, all the owners' files uh, towards the release branches, and I'm not sure if that even makes sense. Um, so. Um, my proposal would be, like I said, to filter out, um, to, to create a list of reviewers and approvers that are existing in the main branch and filter all those out that don't exist in the main branch anymore. Um, are there any objections to that or could we probably do it like that? Uh, no intrinsic objection to that proposal, but dumb question. Uh, don't we have branch protection in place? Are you allowed to even commit directly to a release branch? Uh, we have branch protection in place. I'm not completely sure if all release branches are protected actually. Like I think the newer ones should be. Um, but yeah, in, in general, normally, um, I think that no one even can commit directly to any release branch. So um, maybe, can can you rephrase the question probably? Maybe yeah, you know it. what, I'm overthinking it. We can always create a merge request and merge it properly. I was just confusing myself. Never mind, noise. <laughs> no, I think it's a valid, valid request. I, I was uh, thinking about creating a proud job or something like that, that would just create a pull request to, to sync the release branches with the main branch so that we have a proper workflow uh, in place that doesn't um, like uh, diverge from what we're doing otherwise, if that makes sense. Um, did, did we try as hard as we could to... Uh just have Prow look at the only main for the owners, uh, even if you're in a release branch. And, and have we like talked to the team, to the Prow team and made sure that that was truly impossible? Um, my research at least has not found anything like uh, that there is something in place like syncing release branches, owners or like owners files for release branches. 
but I probably, yeah, you're right. Maybe I should take another look and, and go deeper in that. Yeah, ideally, the honest files for the release branches would just be ignored and only the main one would be looked at. That's yeah. that, that's the way to go if, if we can make it work. Although I suspect that that uh, the owner's uh, plugin is not as complex as we would want it to be. So I think like um, at the moment, it's always looking at the owner's files in the branch that it's currently looking at. So so Prow just uh, evaluates from, from that commit point, um, which it just checked out. So um, that's, that's my... Um, my current um, understanding, but yeah, I'm I'm going to look at um, uh, to look at that again. But so, given that this might not work, uh, are we still uh, probably uh, do do we have any other objections um, against um, like uh, filtering out non-existing reviewers and approvers from the main branch? I mean, either way, we need to clean these up like, as soon as possible, because obviously if we remove people from approver or reviewer, there was a good reason for it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I agree. Yeah. So this actually this came came up when we looked at our backlog from uh, of tasks that we were uh, wanting to uh, wanting to do. And so this popped up again. We completely dropped the ball on that one. So um, this is quite I think that you even like um, mentioned that at least a year ago or something like that. So it's quite an old task, but I'll going, I'm going to revisit that. I've been an approver from quite a while, so, so I can approve all your PRs in the release branches. <laughs> just, just ping me. OK, OK, great. Um, which brings us to another thing. So um, not only the onus of um, for the release branches might be a problem, but also we have like um, uh, we have project definitions that go back to 0 0.13. And my assumption is that we don't even use them anymore. And just to be better safe than sorry, uh, we should probably remove old configs to avoid security issues so that no one silently somehow runs proud jobs on old versions or even does like a like a denial of service or something like that. So my question would be, um, how many versions do we currently need to keep? I figure that obviously like for the one point X versions, we need to keep all of them, but like the um, the history should probably be cut at 0 0.50 or something. What does the community think about that? So maybe, maybe my question wasn't clear enough. So we have um, proud job definitions for all the release branches. Um, and whenever you uh, create a merge or a pull request against any of the release branches, a couple of projects will be kicked in, will be kicking in. And for example, like if you create a merge uh, or a pull request against like say 049, a release branch, you would kick off a bunch of uh, proud jobs. And I'm not sure if that is a good idea to keep it because I think we don't need them. And this might might open up a broader question of how many release branches we would keep, but I don't want to open that door. Um, I was just uh, thinking about like just uh, removing the configurations for older release branches would be enough so that at least the jobs would not be kicked off. Um, and again, uh, my question would be, where do we cut the line? Like, for example, like, uh, do we cut it at 0 0.50, 0 0.40, or whatever do you think would be a good idea. You're basically asking which branch is guaranteed to never get any PR ever again. Exactly, something like that. Because I actually I have no idea. Um, I, I could see a PR against zero forty nine, uh, maybe, but uh, nothing before that. As at least as far as Red Hat is concerned, it's kind of like a. It depends on what downstream uh, companies are maintaining. 
Yeah, that would be probably like a vendor question somehow, right? So which vendors are going back to how many how many branches are um, actually we can... like, are they maintaining? Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just saying that, uh, I mean, other projects, they usually keep uh, about three branches, um, three releases back. And, um, and we could say that uh, uh, these releases uh, actively accept, like a uh, last release actively accept uh, changes, but some other releases can only accept uh, um, like security issues, security updates. Um, when you say... Uh, keep are you implying that we should delete branches older than that because I would actively oppose that because there's other uh, Companies Nvidia Google, you know, not to just naming a random couple uh, That have a vested stake that we should we should definitely bring that up with all maintainers before doing something that aggressive. Yeah, I would argue not to accept new PRs, but uh, not to delete the branches. Okay, then no no opposition how difficult would it be to re-implement um, the, the Prow infrastructure if something did come up for, say, randomly 0.45? I think this is more of a policy question than a, unless I misunderstood, you would, you, like there's nothing you need to do to Prow, you would just not accept PRs. Are we just talking about pre submits here? Yes, exactly. So currently we are just so to get back to my initial question, um, I was just asking uh, which configurations for or config whether we should delete configurations for release branches older than X, just in order to um, not kick off the proud jobs for those. That that was my initial question, I think. Uh, but we're but we're not talking about any uh, like any periodics, right? I mean, there's no periodics running for okay minus three, I guess, right? Um, in that case, it suggests anything below uh, one point zero, to be honest. I have the feeling that, that and that's a similar thing to what, what Vladik already said, right? So I, I, I think like this could be a good streamline to, um, to look at the latest really releases or something, which is a similar thing to what we do with the Kubernetes uh, compatibility. So um, yeah, but uh, yeah, again, I, I'm not completely sure what other vendors than Red Hat need. So um, um, I've just added the question to the to the document. Maybe we just need to uh, leave it a bit at that, and maybe we'll get some feedback over the mailing list when the release, when the community meeting notes are published. Well, well I mean, I, I don't think we should be too concerned over what uh, different vendors might need. Uh, even Reddit, to be honest. Um, I mean, I, I would I would just keep 1.0 because we have some like stronger API guarantees, you know, starting from 1.0. Um, but other than that, I mean, if it wasn't for that, I would probably keep like the last three. But given that we still backport stuff from 1.0 to 1.0. Uh, it's valuable to keep those as well. Yeah, I mean, but uh, you you want backport uh, regular bugs in there, right? I mean, you would uh, ideally want to backport something that is very critical to a release that is uh, very like was very far uh, from the uh, from the current one. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's why I was saying, like, you know, maybe just as a, uh, you know, as a baseline, I guess, for, for now, we could keep from 1.0 onwards. Uh, but then we could just keep, uh, you know, the last three supported releases, I guess. And then as Vladik said, if the, if the bug is critical enough, we, we might accept the PR anyway, if, 
uh, if it is made on an old enough branch. I mean, another option could also be like just uh, downsizing the number of jobs that are being run there. So like removing things up. So maybe I, I just did think to simply and just removing the configurations for the for the release branches somehow. Um, yeah, maybe I maybe I need to make up my mind again. So um, I'm, I'm just uh, closing closing myself uh, out here and um, I'm thinking I'll, I'll be thinking a bit about that. Um, I mean, yeah, our, our support um, policy is that we support the last three. Anything after that is kind of like a, um, it's not a guarantee. It's just a if someone in the community is willing to go the extra mile to um, make any updates to that. And so, yeah, I, I agree with Antonio. I might be slightly more lenient and say the two most recently unsupported versions. Um, but also I can, I can see a, a rationale for cutting it out of supported uh, releases. Um, and at least then it's a, you know, it requires some more manual attention in the, in the off chance that we do have anything that needs to go. When, is anyone able to tell, like, when was the last time we had to backport anything, like, outrageously old? We're backporting to 1.2 right now or 1.0. Let me double check that. I think the oldest I've that's... seen lately was 1.0, yes. Uh, I haven't seen anything older than that. Okay, I mean, I would, I would, I wouldn't call that outrageously unsupported. I'd say that's just, you know, slightly missing the boat. Um, but anything in the in the in the pre one point zero, if we're okay, we're negative. That in the, last uh, year. the break break. The <laughs> oldest uh, branch that we're currently backporting to is zero point fifty eight. Oof. Yeah, that's fun. When was that? The, let me rephrase. The oldest branch that we would likely target because of bug fixes or CVEs is 0 0.58. Right, but I think um, I think what Daniel is trying to suggest is like the start of uh, the introduction of a policy maybe. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think we will uh, we'll have to stop you know, right away backporting like very critical fixes to very old branches. It's just that maybe we'll have a different policy. Yeah, um, I hear you. Uh, I, I'm just, <laughs> I always hate to bring up corporate interests, but the support policy of uh, Red Hat uh, requires us to backport, at, at, you know, to versions that we support. So it's in our interest, maybe not the communities, but that puts us at odds because we're we would actually propose uh, backports to branches that if we set to the only the last three that would not that just doesn't work. I'll uh, direct yeah. people's attention to Lubo's comment in chat because I think it's the um, that's a great idea putting it into the mailing list and then having a process where people can ask for exceptions. Okay, sure. I mean, just just as a last uh, note on that one, um, removing the prog configs doesn't mean that a branch or or a pull request cannot get merged anymore. This is only just that no prog jobs are being uh, being kicked off. So um, this might still be mergeable, uh, but only without tests. And I'm I, obviously, that is a bad idea, but yeah, it, at least That's horrible. it doesn't hinder. Yeah, <laughs> I think exactly. <laughs> we're, we're, we're making the situation measurably and demonstrably worse for what it, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, so given, yeah, I, I'll just, I think we just should take it to the mailing list. I'm going to uh, create the proper ask to the mailing list for that one. Da Daniel, what's the um, real concern here, like for security? The concern is um, like in in conjunction with uh, like um, having old reviewers and approvers in on the boat for old branches. You could probably um, inject something from someone who has been a member earlier days. 
um, to a very old branch um, and also like kick, kick off. Um, so another aspect for me would be um, running proud jobs um, on a very high rate, for example, that blocks anything else um, in our CI. But given that, I think this is like a, just a, I, I figure this is a minor um, security concern, but th this is also like housekeeping, you know? I think like uh, just when I saw release 0.13, I thought this rang a bell to me, should we even keep this? So that's, that's I think like it's more than a housekeeping thing than really a security concern. Coming back to reviewers and approvers, that should be that could be a thing, but like the the um, the proud configurations is just housekeeping, I think. Maybe we could just switch those. Um, I'll say unsupported versions, but let's say very old versions and for resistance to uh, like you'd have to um, maybe like approvers or uh, yeah, I'd say approvers had have to like manually um, start the pre-submits, like they have to give an okay or something like that. I mean, so the so we 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 would keep the configurations, but we wouldn't um, you wouldn't have the pro jobs uh, getting triggered automatically by a by a backport. Okay, so you're suggesting that we need an okay to test for older branches. Mm, sort of, yeah. Which sure could still... But it comes back to Jed's comment from 10 minutes ago is we still should be using the current owners or main for that. So if we can solve that problem, then why everything else doesn't need to be discussed. We would just use the owners or main. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I was mainly thinking about security uh, bugs that might be in very old branches um that someone could uh take advantage of by you know hijacking something in a backport pr but maybe that that's a bit of a, too much of a stretch in terms of like a security concern i don't know well you're you're <laughs> i mean you're not completely in the realm of fantastical there was an issue a couple of years ago where uh you could let me remember how this worked we there was something to do with historical versions and that did come up so it's not completely insane to think about it yeah i was i mean i was mainly thinking about the open source uh uh and i don't remember what, what what software it was but you know i guess you all remember what happened i think last this year like the game of you or something where like a maintainer uh uh Hijack whatever library that was. Uh, what was it like? Zlib something like that. Like was compression. Yeah, XZ, Z, yeah, XZ is there was some uh, more yeah, common yeah. name. I forget. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I was thinking about like something like that, but a little bit different. So you know, like something that someone that could take advantage of the automatic pipeline and getting advantage of security of non-security bugs because I mean those are not maintain branches so they... I maintain that we're overthinking this is somebody that was at one point trusted is probably still trusted there's very few situations where somebody is removed from the community with hostility and just go back and remove them from all historical branches in that case right I mean other than that yeah. even if somebody from you know five years ago is still in the roster we trusted them then yeah, no, I was. Uh, I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't arguing about that. But rather than rather than the ability from anyone to open a PR uh, like a backport and having the uh, proud jobs getting kicked off immediately. Yeah, I think. I think at this point, I would motion to table this and move it to the mailing list just for in the in the interest of time. But I, it's an important topic to to resolve. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, that's this. Um, next one is just a raise of attention. Um, I have created a um, 
PR in the community that um, initially uh, uh, tries to uh, create the charter and things um, required for establishing the working group for code quality. Um, I'm just posting the PR for everyone into the chat. Um, this is just about like the working group charter and a bit of adjustments around the SIG list generation. Um, so the main thing is um, that we, um, that we uh, define goals for what the code quality working group has, um, wants to achieve, um, and a couple of objectives that, that we added here. Um, and yeah, so everyone who wants to hop on the train and take a look at this, um, please give us a ping over the mailing list. We can include you into the next meeting, probably if you're interested in joining the SIG, uh, uh, not the SIG, but the working group for code quality. Um, and yeah, that, that should be it for that. So I think like uh, this is the open floor. Um, Andrew, you have a comment here um, about the community meeting. Yeah, I can jump in. Uh, and yeah, it's nice to see the Code Quality Working Group uh, testing out this new um, working group process that we were working on just a couple of months ago. Uh, next week's community meeting will be canceled due to the uh, unconference that we're running next week. And if your question just now was what unconference, then I highly recommend clicking on one or both of the threads I've got linked there. Uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday, the 29th and the 30th of October at 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock UTC. Um, we're having, uh, yeah, two days, two three-hour days of um, uh, basically discussion. Um, for those that don't know what an unconference is, it's really a self-directed series of discussions. It's not presentations. Um, everyone that comes is welcome to suggest topics to talk about. Um, and everyone is uh, expected is a strong word, but um, I'm okay with that today. Uh, everyone is expected to engage and participate in the discussion uh, because everyone's perspective and experience and viewpoint is, is valid and should be shared. Um, so the, uh, one, of the, one of the key priorities for this is to um, focus on the uh, 1.5 development phase, come up with some things to prioritize as far as features are concerned, and that can then tumbles down into what might take priority um, in our window for uh, reviewing and approving and, and things like that. It's also an opportunity to talk about some of the bugbears and barriers that we might uh, experience that we don't otherwise get an opportunity to talk about. Um, the first day will be three rooms, one each for SIG Compute, SIG Network, and SIG Storage. Um, and the, I, the hopeful idea, we've never done this before, is that people will potentially either stay in one room or they'll bounce around a bit depending on what topic's being talked about. So there is a light schedule that hopefully we'll, we'll stick to. Day two is for literally everything else. Um, so if you click on the uh, calendar or the second link there, what is an unconference anyway? You'll get taken to the Hedgestock instance. You can log in through GitHub um, and you can add topics to any of the day two stuff or any of the, the SIG specific things. Um, and then on the day, we'll basically vote which interests us most and then we'll take it away. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. If not, um, yeah, any questions here or on the mailing list or on Slack? Otherwise, I'll pass it over to Antonio. No questions? Okay. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to mention that um, I recently opened the APR that GAs the live update feature gate. So, and that's going to merge um, pretty soon. And I just wanted to bring the attention over the fact that I plan to um, make the live update follow strategy as default for uh, 1.5, uh, for which we are just at the beginning of the cycle. And yeah, I just wanted to take the chance of um, 
making some sort of a survey, uh, you know, if anyone uh, is particular again, particularly against this, uh, or there's, you know, if there's any pushback, um, just a request for comments. I think the only thing we need to do is uh, is really send the uh, um some kind of a notification to to the mailing list. I, okay. I think that the uh, the Google uh, we're counting on the fact that it's uh, not live updatable, but I, I don't know. We should uh, should raise this. Yeah. Okay. I'll uh, what's the the PR um. The GS feature gate, I'll send on an email. Uh, just um, just a note, I mean, the stage setting, which is the default settings or default setting right now, will still be available. Uh, so if uh, someone needs it, they can use it. Um, a little bit wide, do you think it's a little bit aggressive? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, just because you are going to GA the feature and make it a default in the same release, I would, my expectation as a user would be, you know, having this as a GA, having it, uh, giving it a go, uh, seeing if this is something I'm interested in and then uh, I would have probably some kind of opinion on the matter of this if this would should be a uh, default or not. <clears throat> but definitely we need to be as as you know um, as loud as we can because this is a break change and I would really not be happy if we break someone. Do we know yeah. what happens in the, in in the Kubernetes? I mean. Do they normally do both of these changes at the same time? I'm not sure if there is anything comparable. I mean, not that, that I know of. Uh, isn't there... Um, I would think that the, at some point before GAing this, uh, the feature gate becomes uh, enabled by default and then uh, they graduate. I'm not sure. We we should also consult the document that we ourselves wrote. I mean, Eddie wrote. Um, how do we graduate uh, feature gates? I mean, the, the the thing is, like, the feature gate will be graduated in one point five. That's already been approved, and it's going to merge uh, soon. As I said, the what what I propose to change as well in one point five is the um, default volume for the uh, rollout strategy. Which is not a feature kit per se, like it's just a configuration knob. Um, um, I I know um, it might sound aggressive, but I don't think it is because the feature kit itself has been present since one point zero, and we, you know, also like in our own constraint, for speaking of Reddit. Uh, we, we have done uh, excessive testing and there has been a lot of bug fixes upstream and stabilization work. So um, I would actually like to do it at the beginning of the cycle uh, so that we get as much testing as possible. And, you know, we, even if we, I'm pretty confident that there won't be any major issues because as I said, we already have had major testing uh, on this. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the, the main concern is to break somebody else. I mean, if we didn't uh, change um, the default behavior of this feature gate ahead of time, uh, right? So these other people um, who were consuming this API didn't even get to expose. Uh, I mean, it, it didn't affect them in any way. I mean, if the feature gate was down all the time. Yeah, I, I understand your concern. Uh, I think the solution to that is just being vocal about it on the mailing list. So, I mean, even if we, 
if we waited another release, like 1.5, we GA the feature again at 1.6, we uh, switch the default configuration. I don't think any, I don't think it's gonna change much to be honest, because they would still have to know that that is happening for the next release and hard code stage in the Kubernetes CR if they want to keep the old behavior. So in terms of like the changes needed from whoever is using Kubernetes, I don't think it actually changes anything. We're just being more conservative, um, which I mean for this feature, I don't think it's actually required because I mean we. I'm pretty like I said, I'm, I'm pretty confident the feature is mature. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, um, I think justifying one experience, but like I, just having one, uh, everyone's experience by one experience is a little bit um, uh, not strong enough, in my opinion. But um, if you if you if we do what you say, for example, one point five GA and then one point six. Uh, and 1.6 uh, change of the default, then you give a time, everybody, equal time to test the changes. Because these changes, these changes are not only about, you know, how we roll out the changes of the VM, but it also uh, changes the ABI of the VM. So you now have more CPUs there that are offline, you have the virtual MEM device, and there might be VMs that needs a little bit of configuration to disable these, right? Uh, and I, what I'm, yeah, sorry. No. And by giving, you know, at least one release of having a GA on this feature uh, and also having the notice of, of the change, you give them time to test these stuff in, this, in some kind of staging environment or however, however they want to do it. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I understand that. Uh, that's why I, I'm proposing to do it at the beginning of the cycle, so that you know we're not going to release until I don't know, sometime next year. Um, uh, what is it? Three months? Uh, I'm not sure. So I don't know. My I thought that would be enough. Uh, but if you guys, you know, want to wait for 1.6, uh, I mean, it's not like, um, it's okay. Like, I don't, I don't mind too much. I just think personally having worked on it, the, the whole thing is pretty, it's pretty stable. And since that's the future, I would like to start investing in it, even in terms of like uh, upstream testing as soon as possible rather than uh, waiting out uh, a lot of time. I mean, I'm always of the opinion that, you know, upstream we we should be bleeding edge, even in terms of like how we take our decisions. Then if someone else doesn't want to, they just, you know, uh, use the configuration now to default to the old behavior. Uh, as long as like a change is well communicated, I don't think that's an issue, um, but yeah. Yeah, you're right. But I mean, we agree to a certain process, right? <laughs> How do we graduate a uh, feature gate? Yeah, no, the, the thing is like the, the process is about feature gates. This is not a feature gate. Yeah, but even in the in that process, we didn't follow. I see that Lubo approved this PR, but uh, this um, this feature gate was never enabled by default before approving that. Sorry, the, the, the feature was never enabled by default? Yes. Well, I mean that cannot happen until it's GA. But we, but again, that that's what I'm saying. That we agree to a certain process. That we're going to follow a certain process. And uh, and now we are diverging from this. How do we expect other people to follow the process? Like, it, like just to that point, um, when we were making the process, we didn't state what will happen with the features that are already existing. And this one is one of those. So that's why we didn't follow the same flow or the process we we set up. I, I don't know. I, I don't see a difference, but. I don't see as well, but I, I did have, have the remark on the PR, I believe. And 
it specifically did not talk about it. Yeah, anyway, uh, that's fine that we are uh, removing the feature gate, but uh, it's not fine that we are changing the behavior at the same time. I don't think that we shouldn't do it. We should notify everyone that this is going to happen and then uh, change. Same thing that we did with the uh, with non root. I agree, but the non root was less disruptive, to be honest. Depends to who. I mean, I think the non root was a bit more disruptive, or at least he had the, uh, you know, uh, likeliness of being more disruptive. To be honest, I think companies that uh, uh, build they have an operator that build VMs and make changes to the VMs using an operator will feel the disruption. Uh, some kind of GitOps as well. You know, I, I mean, I, I get that. Um, I just think that, and, and, and again, I'm fine in just delaying this to 1.6. So, you know, just sending out emails uh, in 1.5 and then doing this in, in 1.6. I just think as a general rule, we should be, we shouldn't be afraid of taking uh, decisions, uh, especially in things we already decided we want to invest into. Uh, and the, the, the important bit is that we, I mean, we, we, we just, you know, let everyone choose whatever they want in terms of like your behavior, um, as long as we expose the right configuration knobs. And this is one of those cases. Uh, but I, I understand your, um, you know, your concerns. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not against uh, making changes, but again, we I think we agreed to a certain process that these changes will get enabled by default first, and then we, we uh, graduate them. I think that's the process. And as, as far as, as I know, with your proposal, you would need to enable alpha or beta Peter gate, then uh, explicitly set the behavior to stage, then update the feature kit will be gone and default will yeah. be something else. So <clears throat> doesn't sound correct to me. I think it should be GA, then I should be aware of the change so I can explicitly set that I want the staging behavior and then I can upgrade to a version which changes the behavior. Yeah, I, I agree with Lugo. Otherwise, how can you have the chance to try it without enabling the feature game? Yeah, but we didn't do even the the the, the first part. We didn't set. Uh, I mean, before graduating, we didn't enable the feature gate, so people were not even exposed. I mean, people who who didn't uh, notice these changes, they were not exposed to this API at all. It was always di uh, di disabled by default. No, I mean, I mean the, the, the PR that's posted in the document that only enables the feature game, that only GAs the feature game, that is, doesn't change the configuration. That's why I'm bringing it up. I'm bringing it up here because, uh, I mean, for now it's just a something that I wanted to propose. I mean, I haven't implemented it. I will implement. You know, thought about making two different PRs because of this. I don't know. Uh, I would be very loud about this uh, and do it in stages uh, rather than uh, having a chance to break somebody. And, and you know, I'm all for this feature. <laughs> that's that's not about yeah, that. Yeah, that's yeah. about the process. I know. I. I don't agree. Like I would, uh, I would uh, do it um, in this release, but I, I do understand that uh, you know I, I might be overconfident because I have more experience than anyone else. Uh, I mean, in the community, probably uh, with this. I mean, like uh, us, uh, not me. Uh, us, right now.
Okay, so I'm not completely sure what conclusion we have drawn from this. Do we now, how do we proceed? Do we now like add uh, some or send something, or send a notification to the mailing list about this or how do we continue with that? I mean, the, the PR is already going in, so that's, that's, is done. Um, I would suggest uh, taking it to the mailing list. Uh, first, asking people if they are okay with the, um, with the default changing. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, removing the feature gate doesn't change anything. Like, uh, QGRP will work as it worked uh, yesterday. Um, so yeah, I'll just send out an email uh, proposing this change for 1.6. Uh, uh, since, uh, <laughs> I mean, the consensus here, uh, I mean, it sounded like you, you guys are more um, comfortable with having this in 1.6, so. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, I think we don't have anything else for the open floor. If there is no more, uh, no more further comments to that um, live update rollout strategy stuff. Um, I would probably just want to uh, grab your attention. Uh, all the community approvers and reviewers here. Um, I have a pull request uh, that I would want to get in that updates the uh, how the repo group SQL is updated for the CNCF dev sets uh, dashboard that we have. Um, and I would definitely need someone with approval right so that we can get this in. Um, and uh, this is like just like a small go to that I wrote that uh, generates from the um, six YAML uh, SQL that will then get merged into the CNCF dev sets configuration. So um, I would uh, really appreciate if anyone would have time to look at this. Shouldn't be too hard. Um, I, mean, I don't know how, how many people have maintainer access or commit uh, approval rights in the community repo, by the way. I don't think I do, for instance. I can approve it yeah. if uh, two LGTMs uh, from people that can actually vet the code. I can approve it as well, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I was looking at this and I was a little bit lost uh, because I'm not sure what does it even, uh, I mean, how does it all come together? Uh, I'm not sure how does it look like. Um, so just, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's so like, like uh, to, to, do, to be described in, uh, in uh, only one or two sentences, but I'm, I'm going to try. Um, so, um, the cube so cncf provides a couple of dashboards for every project that is below the cncf umbrella and we have like lots of like uh, uh, interactivity um, that is bundled or th there is lots of like uh, dashboards that which you can use to see what is going on um, inside the cube github repos and one point of that is like grouping activity to certain uh, groups. Like, for example, so what we, our initial idea was we wanted to group it with uh, respect to SIGs. Um, and that's actually what we are trying to do here. Um, so the SIGs YAML describes what SIGs are there, and they have like references to owners files. And um, I, uh, converted an existing tool that was written in Python into like a small Golang tool that creates sequels that will get merged into that CNCF dev sets repository, which will then be used to generate like the repository, no, sorry, uh, the groups uh, assignment for the several uh, activities that are inside the GitHub repositories. So for example, if you do like a pull request, um, or if you do like a review or if you do anything like that as GitHub activity will be displayed in one of those, uh, one of those 
um, um, dashboards. Um, does that does that make sense a bit, or did I miss a point? No, no, it it makes total sense. I just don't know, like I mean, how, how the changes are are being presented there. But I mean, I I, I trust you. <laughs> How do you test this? I mean, how do you see that uh, the squad uh, is doing the right thing? I mean, it's... <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point, because like uh, I just create the pull request and then uh, the guy from, uh, from, from DevStuff's repository takes a look at it and merges, uh, merges it normally. So um, in general, I think like those, um, those updates to repository groups don't happen too often. Uh, I mean, with looking at the SIG process that we are establishing, um, there might be more um, more of the updates to come. But at least it's like um, um, at least there is some control instance that looks at this and doesn't just accept it. And um, so those people are uh, pretty much um, like over overlooking all the changes and. Um, yeah, so I, I'm in close contact uh, whenever there is something, and he's he's pinging me uh, most of the time when there is something going on. I see. All right, I'll I'll try to to do my best. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so I see we're already three minutes over time. Um, so I figure that there is no time for mailing list review, bug scrub, or flaky test fixes. Um, Andrew, do you have something that we would need to take a quick look at, or should we close out right now? He said he had to drop a bit ago. I think he may still be here, but I, I think we, we have a different conflicting meeting that's already kicked off. So. Oh, okay. Yes. Then I think it's just, um, yeah, sorry for, for the bug scrub uh, preparation. I hope that we don't, didn't miss something. People who are interested in uh, uh, doing bug scrub um, for these issues that have been pointed out here, please take it to the mailing list so that we can discuss it there. Other than that, I would probably just uh, right now close out uh, the community meeting. Thanks everyone for your attendance. Um, thanks for your participation um, and probably see you next week to the unconference. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Bye.